Dr. Van Hooser introduced us to Exodus on Tuesday. Chapel, I'd like to build on that a little bit this morning as we look at chapter 16. But first, let me remind you that Exodus is an epic, it's an epic, epic book, Bible. After all, every story about God, about God's character, about God's mighty acts, about God's fashioning a people for himself is epic after all, isn't it? One commentator summarizes it like this. It begins with a nation in slavery, the would-be deliverer born under threat of drowning. It continues with a cosmic confrontation between good and evil, a mighty act of rescue, a long journey to freedom. It has a reluctant hero, a cruel villain, overwhelming disasters, spectacular miracles, barren wilderness, a mountaintop experience, feasts and festivals, music and dancing, close encounters with God Almighty. For those of you for whom this would be a helpful analogy, it's sort of a mashup of Lord of the Rings, Halo, Iron Man, this old house, and even Project Runway when you get to the point where you have to make vestments <laughs> for worship. Now, for those of you who had no idea what I just said, in terms of popular culture reference, why don't you take a break from the cubby, have a sandwich, go see a film, do something. <laughs> and for those of you who are in the cubby, um, not maybe enough. Get in this great book in God's Word. So chapter 16 zooms in on those early days of the wilderness walk to the promised land. It offers a glimpse of how God will be shaping this people, how he will be forming them into his inheritance, how he will continue to fulfill the covenant promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He will test them to see if and how they walk in his law. He will listen to their complaints and receive their praise. He will be their God over and over and over and over again. Amen? God has, by this time, freed them from Egypt's bondage, but they have not yet received. They've not yet claimed. They've not yet figured out how to be his possession. Again, as Dr. Van Hooser said on Tuesday, God is polishing them. He's polishing them so that they can practice the worship of God in all of life. So, so they're free, but they're not formed. So let's take a brief look back to remember how we arrived at this point in the wilderness story. A question. How does then an unshackled people, but yet still sinful people, live with such a holy God in her midst? Well, the answer is much like the people in waiting before they were unshackled. It was an earthy mix of grumbling and dissatisfaction and remembrance and frustration and hope and struggle. Nothing new under the sun there. Generations of suffering can breed a grumbling culture, can it? But it can also evoke faithfulness and heroism, as the midwives demonstrated in chapter 1. They did not kill the Hebrew male babies as Pharaoh instructed them to do. They instead became models of covenant fidelity to their Lord God Almighty. So understandably, as Moses tells us in chapter 3, the people cried out. They cried out to their God about being slaves in Egypt to Pharaoh. That Pharaoh, he treated them harshly. As chapter 1 tells us, most likely out of his own insecurity and his own fear of this people, lest they become a great and awesome nation. Little did he know. Little did he know. Later in chapter 5, Moses tells us that the people grumbled about making bricks without straw. This came in the aftermath of the initial request to Pharaoh to let God's people go. 
Then further on in chapter 14, they grumbled about their apparent imminent death at Pharaoh's hand just before the divided sea became their escape route. More grumbling. There's always this, did you bring us this far? Just have us die. What kind of a boneheaded plan was this, Moses? And you know, the text even says, they weren't really complaining against Moses. They were complaining against God. But remember, they, they walked out of Egypt. That's sort of a nonsense statement, isn't it? They walked out of Egypt. You don't walk out of Egypt when you've been slaves in Egypt. You don't walk out. You die there after you've served Pharaoh for all your life. You do anything but walk out. As I said, they hadn't yet grasped the magnitude of God's mighty arm of deliverance. They hadn't yet figured out how pervasive his salvation would become. So following this really incomparable miracle of walking through the sea, basically three days, according to chapter 15, verse 22, the people grumbled then about not having tasty water to drink. Three days, three days into the walk. Anytime they grumbled and every time they grumbled, the Lord heard them, our texts say. The Lord heard his people. He responded with timely provision, his time, his perfect timing, timely provision. As you know, that's a great theme in all of Scripture, isn't it? God's timely provision. He's always right on time. It doesn't seem like it, but he's good and faithful. Friends, I, I have no idea what we're all grumbling about today. I just know we are. Here's the, here's the good news. The Lord does not turn away grumblers. I don't know about you, I'm really grateful that this passage is in the scripture. Because I'm here. I'm right here. Who do I identify with? Am I the person on the sideline telling the Lord, yeah, give it to them. Give it to those grumblers. You know, and if I'd have been there, I'd have been on the Lord's side. I wouldn't have been grumbling. Oh, no, no, no. No, I'm first in the grumbling line. Before I got here this morning, I grumbled about 16 things. I counted. <laughs> I mean, it's only 1120. I've got 20, 30 more things to grumble about through the rest of the day. Grumble, grumble, grumble. And yet the Lord does not toss them aside. He doesn't leave them in the wilderness. He hears them. He doesn't turn them away. He doesn't turn us away. He does not leave us to ourselves. Friends, the bread comes down. So now back to chapter 16. Forty-five days into what will be, as we know, quite a long walk to freedom, the people are, you guessed it, grumbling again. But this time they're grumbling about food. Now look, you need food and water to survive anywhere, right? Let alone in the wilderness. But this grumbling was more about food and drink. It was about trust. It was about misunderstanding where the promised land was. It was about receiving their gift of adoption as God's people. It was about believing Moses was God's covenant mediator. He, he got the right person. He was mailing them to the right address. He didn't get it wrong. It was about learning the rhythm of work and rest. It was learning about how to receive Sabbath. It was about trusting God every day for every life, in every way, in every area of life. That's what it was about. But listen, the people had mistaken Egypt for the promised land. Can you imagine? The place where they, as Dr. Scharf read, they sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full, according to verse 3, chapter 16. Content with food and drink, but enslaved to a king, not their own. 
They were ready to forfeit their whole inheritance as a blessing to the nations from Genesis 12. Forfeit the whole inheritance for some stew and bread. They thought the actual promised land, in fact, was no place they'd ever see. They misunderstood who God is and who they are. They think God the rescuer, God the deliverer. It's God the enslaver and not Pharaoh. The whole perspective was on its head. And then the Lord announces that bread will rain down. Timely provision. He's heard the grumbling rather than cast them off. I'm going to get me a new people to fashion. He says, no, no. He graces them. He'll provide daily bread, evening meat. He provides instructions for the rhythm of gathering and eating and Sabbath provision. He appears in the cloud to assure them. His glory shines. His kingship reigns. He reminds them. He forms them. He shapes them. He rescues the inheritance for the nation. He says, you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Verse 12. Make no mistake, friends. He's the God of his people, and they're becoming the people of his God. The great I am has provided. Well, as you remember, the parallels with our Lord Jesus Christ, the bread of life himself, are just striking. I wish we just had all day, all day, We wouldn't wear it out. We couldn't get to the end of it. To look at John 6 and Exodus 12 and go back and forth and encourage each other in all the ways the Lord Jesus Christ fulfills every promise as the bread of life. It's just spectacular. I I just can't commend the study enough to you for your own edification, for your own walk with the Lord Jesus. But just a few observations. Like God's people in Exodus, the Jewish leaders, this time in John 6, the Jewish leaders were grumbling. Give us more Moses. Give us more manna. Give us more signs. Let's have a circus. Not God himself. Not the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the bread of life himself. Like God's people in Exodus, the leaders said, you know what, we want the status quo. We want to keep that. We, we want to maintain our slavery, thank you very much. Our best days are behind us. That's a rally, isn't it? <laughs> our best days are back there. Jesus, Jesus all through the Gospel of John invites whoever, whoever, class or rank, I mean, whoever, believe in him, receive him, live now and forever. His invitation makes it clear. Best days are now and in the future abiding with him. Amen? Listen to what Jesus says, John records in John 6. I'm the bread of life that's come down from heaven. I'm the bread of life, verse 48. Verse 51, I am the living bread. Verse 58. Our fathers ate manna and died, feast on me and live. God comes down and God's people are raised up. Go back and read John 6, verse 38 and 54. You see how the Lord himself comes down and the people are raised up. There's a real interesting key to remember in John 6 as well in verse 11. The text says, when he had given thanks, when he had given thanks, he fed the multitude. When he had given thanks. He didn't grumble about having too little fish and too little bread. It wasn't tasty enough. It wasn't enough of it. It didn't come at the right time. Where are you now? Did you bring? He didn't hear any of that from Jesus, did he? None of that. He's being the true Israelite again. He's being the one who's always about his father's business, the business of forming persons and a people for himself in his world by the power of the Spirit. He's the bread of life. Hallelujah. 
So in summary, God provides. The bread comes down. God's people get to respond. Because remember, God always always honors the image bearers he's made. He always honors the image bearers he's made. He invites our joyous life responses of trust, commitment, dwelling in him, resting in him, as we love him and our neighbors and our life callings. So, so you receive, but then you also give away. There's work to do. They, they had to go collect the manna and the quail. They had things to do. They were agents. They were responsible. They were image bearers. God takes that very seriously. So a few takeaway considerations for us as we reflect on his word this morning. How can we ask the Lord in our prayers, our time with one another, our time at worship, to recognize, name, own our grumble spots? Those places that needle us, those places that the world, the flesh, and the devil. Yeah, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. Let's do some more grumbling. Things about which we're prone. Listen, finances. I understand. I graduated from here a few years ago. We worked many jobs. We raised full support for 12 years in campus ministry. Hey, you got it. It's daily bread. I understand. Troublesome neighbors. Coworker miscommunication. Heavy course loads, comparisons with others. Either what am I doing here or what's she doing here? Remember, comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison is a robber. It, it doesn't help you focus on where you are right now living before the Lord's face. It's a fool's errand. If you doubt God to the point of despair and you're grumbling, we're here. Seek us out. If you ignore God to the point of self-sufficiency, we'll find you. We'll find you. God has provided again. He's provided friends and churches and communities, professors and colleagues, children, spouses. He never leaves himself to provide for his his children. So let me ask you, who, who is, or for those of you who are new here, who, who will be on your team? Let me put it that way. Who, who's going to be on your team at seminary? Who are your fellows? Who are your mentors? Who are those in whom you will invest? All three. All three with the love of Christ. I had a pastor who uh, illustrated this just wonderfully with what he uh, described and illustrated as a hand up and a hand back and a hand to the side. This is sort of assume the position of a Christian. Th this represents teachability, humility. You're always in a position to learn something. This hand back represents always having an opportunity to help somebody else, always having a neighbor to love. And the side to side is, is always having fellows. You're not ever by yourself. It's pretty good, isn't it? Up, back, to the side. We need all three. It's what marks a healthy, maturing Christian. You know what else it does? It also keeps grumbling to a minimum in the trials of life in perspective. Secondly, I think our text leads us to cultivate a thank you life. A thank you life. When we're given a gift, we say thank you. What if, even better yet, we lived thank you? What if thank you is a robust alternative to grumbling? What if, when God provides and we say thank you, what if a life of gratitude would take shape? What if that's what we would look like? Jim Packer calls that habitual disposition. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That's a wonderful way to think of it, isn't it? 
And here's an interesting thing too. When that cultivation, that gratitude becomes more the norm, you want to see the Lord do more and more. You're eager to see his faithfulness on display. You're not doing it to test him, but to trust him. You think, you think less and less about making yourself. You, you remind yourself and others that he is the provider. You, you heed the warning in Deuteronomy 8. You remember the warning in Deuteronomy 8? When you get into the land, you might forget that I'm the one who brought you here. And you look around and say, wow, this is a great place. I wonder how I got here. Oh, that's right, I walked here myself. Nothing new under the sun there. Look at me. I got here all by myself. What foolishness, friends. Go reread Deuteronomy 8. It's just a good, timely word. It, it fends off this foolishness of self sufficiency and it cultivates this sense of gratitude and thank you. We're receivers of God's love and agents of God's redemption. We receive and we offer. We receive and we offer. We receive and we offer. We offer praise to him and service to others. We receive with grateful expectation the provision of the Lord. So don't confuse this with thankless presumption. Oh, yeah, he'll, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, everything's fine. What our texts say to us today? Some of you have heard me say that a great motto to consider in the life of a seminarian is you are not the end of your own education. Friends, we're not the end of anything, let alone the end of our own educations. They're gifts to us for the sake of others. Finally, let's pray to the Lord. Let's keep the temporal and the eternal in perspective. Now and forever are linked together in God's plan and provision. Pray for daily bread and resurrection hope. Daily bread, resurrection hope. The bread has come down. Hallelujah. With joy and gratitude, let's pray for the bread. Pray with me.